All right, thanks everyone. We will get started. So welcome to another Creditor Watch webinar. Today we've got a special guest joining us um, and he's gonna be discussing PPSR recoveries. Obviously he's gonna go into a bit more detail. I won't steal his thunder. As always though, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things. Yes, you can certainly ask questions. Use the uh, GoToWebinar control panel to ask questions and where possible, depending on time, uh, depending on the complexity of the questions that you guys ask as well, we will um, get a Q&A going at the end. And of course, as always, we're recording the webinar today, so we will send a copy of the recording and the presentation slides in the next 24 hours. A little bit about Creditor Watch, for those of you um, who haven't joined us before, um, we're Australia's leading and most innovative commercial credit reporting bureau with well over 50,000 customers. Obviously, for those of you who have joined us before, um, feel free to tune out for a little bit while I give my little spiel about Creditor Watch. A, a huge suite of products that we have, end-to-end -end credit management solution, but you can also pick and choose the little individual products along the way. Creditor Watch is obviously our core product with credit reports, monitoring alerts, there's some debt collection tools there for, for smaller organisations and also large ones, um, credit scoring, payment predictor, that sort of thing. Um, the, other th the other products outside of that core offering includes Datalogic Plus, which is our trade program, allowing you to better understand your accounts receivable ledger, and see how you're being paid versus how your customers are paying the market. Directed due diligence looks at the individuals behind a company and allows you to receive adverse cross-directorship alerts. Apply Easy is our online credit application. PPSR Logic, which is obviously very relevant today, um, is our PPSR solution. Basically anything to do with PPSR, whether it's creation, management, renewal of registrations, um, PPSR searches, etc. All of that can be done through PPSR Logic. And our most recent uh, product that we released is financial risk assessments which allows a more in-depth um, assessment of the financial health of a company. So today we are joined by Daniel Turk, partner at Turks Legal, he's practice head in the commercial group um, and an unashamed Manly Sea Eagle supporter. We're very fortunate to have Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Patrick, thanks for the introduction. Hopefully um, well, Manly fans will be watching the grand final um, uh, with Manly playing in it this year, that would be good. And yes, so that would be yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. So this morning, uh, this afternoon, for the presentation, we're talking about PBSR recoveries. Uh, the I'll be going through when a trade supplier is secured, uh, the various types of insolvency administrations, which is relevant um, because uh, trade suppliers who have unpaid assets will need to be dealing with insolvency practitioners. When an insolvency practitioner can sell the trade supplier's assets, um, cost claims by insolvency practitioners, what they're entitled to claim and what remedies are available for trade suppliers and how you can um, limit those costs where the liquidator is selling um, your assets. And I'll give a couple of, if we've got time, a couple of recent case examples in 2019 as to what liquidators have done with uh, trade suppliers secured assets. So a standard term in most trade suppliers agreements with their customers is that uh, they will still own the goods even though they've parted with possession and handed them over to their customer awaiting payment that they still own the goods until they've been paid for them. So you will um, find a clause on in either the credit application signed by the customer or on the foot of the invoice or the reverse of the invoice or even on the website of the supplier that will uh, say what's sort of in, in, in the third paragraph here or, or thereabouts, title and ownership of the goods in this invoice will not pass to the customer until such time as the invoice is paid in full. That's a very standard clause, and that clause will pass on those rights, or, main, or the, the, the seller, trade supplier, will still have rights to their goods until payment is made. And it's a very important um, 
clause to have in a trading arrangement where you're um, parting with possession of your goods. When um, a, your, those goods are sold subject to payment, 30 day terms, net terms or, or, or whatever the arrangement may be, um, the customer will take those goods and they may end up in a warehouse like this or they may end up in a store or um, in a factory. And then you've got a situation where you have a number of goods supplied not only by the trade supplier but by other trade suppliers to that customer which will be sitting on the floor together um, awaiting sale to customers. And there will also be a situation of course where your customer's customer has purchased the goods and taken possession even though you've never been paid as the original supplier. And in a scenario like this warehouse there, you can imagine that it, um, there's various people who, who are claiming security interests um, through retention of title, through, uh, keep, uh, through that, that term on the back of their invoice over the stock. Um, and also you could have um, a bank which has a security, which has provided finance to the, your customer which, and takes security over all the assets in the possession of the customer. So you could have a bank claiming security over an item of stock, just like the trade supplier who's unpaid for it. So it can get quite confusing and messy and where there's an insolvency of the customer or the owner of this warehouse, the administrator's got to deal with the various claims from trade suppliers who are unpaid and a bank who um, is, is owed repayment of um, an overdraft account, for example. So the PPSA was brought in back, and it started back in 2012, um, that it was uh, to provide a one-stop shop for all um, security interests over personal property. So it doesn't apply to land. So, um, you know, a bank or you, you having title to a house, or investment property, that's got nothing to do with the PPSA register. The personal property securities register deals with um, security interests over non-land assets. So uh, uh, companies that provide finance to motor vehicle companies, when you drive away with the Ford out of the, out of the Ford dealership subject to Ford finance, Ford will register its interest over that car on the personal property securities register. Uh, trade suppliers who provide goods on retention of title terms would have to register on the personal property securities register. Companies, um, banks that provide finance to companies uh, that in the past would register on the ASIC register, now register on the personal property securities register. And what the Act did, it governed all the rules and priorities as between different financiers over those assets. Uh, and go, if you think back to that warehouse picture before, um, where somebody's got to work out who comes first out of the bank and the trade supplier for that box over there, the Act governs those priorities and rules. But what's crucial for um, a trade supplier who's provided goods on credit terms subject to a retention of title clause in their invoice is that they have this registration. So, for a trade supplier to be regarded as a secured creditor, just like a bank is a secured creditor, they have to have um, written terms of trade which have a retention of title clause. That can be written on the invoice, it can be contained in the signed agreed credit application, and it can even be on your website, provided the customer has acknowledged those terms on the website. There needs to be a proper registration by the um, trade supplier on the PPS register. There's a lot of things can go wrong in that registration, so it's crucial that you go to um, uh, an expert like Creditor Watch to do that registration for you. Uh, there's many cases where people have got the registrations wrong or a digit out and it's cost them a lot of money. Uh, and thirdly, that registration needs to occur before the supply of the unpaid goods, otherwise you risk that you will come second in priority to a bank, for example. So it's good when you start trading with a customer to get your registration done. It's never too late. You can always do it later on, but you're really only protected for supply made after your registration. So just on that, 
Um, just to be clear, and, and we're going to have a varying um, level of expertise in terms of our listeners today. You know, you're going to have some people who have never heard of um, the PPSA, and you're going to have some people who are, you know, extremely well versed in it. And I think what's clear is you don't, you cannot just rely on the retention of title clause in a credit application. Correct. That's right. That's right. And that you need to have that registration yep. on the PPSA, uh, and it needs to be before. Yeah. Um, well, to be, have ultimate protection, you need to have that registration in place um, before you start selling your goods. But even if you started selling and then you put it on later on, goods you supplied still after better. that data protection. Still, still better than yeah. nothing. Better yeah. than nothing. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Always get it off. Thank you. Um, so, and the reason why this registration and, and protecting our security interests is so important is because in the um, event that your customer goes into a form of insolvency administration, that unless you are registered on the PPSA, you lose your rights to your goods and the administrator or liquidator gets to keep those goods for to sell um, for the benefit of all creditors um, and his own fees. Before the PPSA started, you didn't have to register and you just tell the administrator or liquidator you wanted your, um, that, that stock is unpaid, I have a right to that, I want it back. But since the PPSA started, Unless there's a proper registration, there is no doubt about it that you don't you're not allowed to get your goods back. So there's um, the various types of insolvency administrations. I just briefly want, want to touch on this um, because you'll hear um, if a customer ever goes into insolvency, words like administrator and liquidator and receiver and, and the difference between them. An administrator is appointed and he takes control of when it, when the company's insolvent and he takes control of the company. For a short period of time, he can trade on the company in that time, and then at the end of it, the creditors decide if it goes into liquidation or um, some other um, compromise agreement is reached. A liquidation, if it goes straight to liquidation, a liquidator is appointed and, and he doesn't really trade on the company, rarely does, he will just sell everything, sell all the assets um, uh, for the, and whatever's left over, pay the creditors a dividend, um, on what they are owed based on the sale of those assets. If a receiver is appointed, that's usually appointed or a, is, is appointed by a secured creditor like a bank and the receiver is only interested in the assets which his security or her security is over. So if the, um, the, a receiver is appointed, for example, by a car financier, it is just going to go in and, and sell the, um, the motor vehicles which are the subject of the security. So they're the three types of administrations. I'm going to talk about the administration um, style insolvency administration um, mostly here. An administrator is appointed by the directors of the company when they believe the company is insolvent or about to become insolvent. And uh, a meeting will be called uh, by those administrators of all the creditors within a week and they'll introduce themselves and tell you what's going on. Uh, then they will take another four weeks to put together a report for all the creditors about what happened to the company, where everything went wrong, these are what the assets of the company are, this is what's gonna, this is, if it goes into liquidation, this is how much you're gonna get back in cents in the dollar on all the assets and uh, the creditors will have to make a decision as to whether it goes into liquidation or if a compromise proposal is put up by the directors um, for everybody to take a lower amount on their debt. During that period, the administrator has powers to trade on the business and sell assets in the normal course. And that's um, something very important to know because the administrator is appointed, you're going, um, I want to get my goods back, but the administrator can just keep running the business in that in that time during that um, uh, four or five week administration period. Importantly for creditors and secured creditors like trade suppliers who have a retention of title and, and there is stock they haven't, there is with the company, their customer and administration that they haven't been paid for, they are restricted from accessing their assets during the administration period even if you've got PPSR registration. Uh, however, and I'll come to this, 
if the administrator sells your goods, he needs to account back to you for those creditors that are registered on the PPSR. If you're not registered on the PPSR, he doesn't have to account his sale proceeds back to you to, to mitigate your unpaid loss, your unpaid debt. Now, uh, trade suppliers who have the benefit of personal guarantees from directors or their family members uh, aren't allowed to bring those guarantee claims whilst they're in this five week period of administration either. So there's all this moratorium that creditors really can't do anything and the administrator can keep running the business. What happens if the administrator sells the goods? Now, um, the administrator is allowed to sell the goods in the ordinary course of business. So if the business that's gone into administration is a shop, the administrator can have customers come in the shop and sell those goods um, even at discount price to those customers um, in the ordinary course of business. Um, administrator, what he's not allowed to do is sell all the assets in one go or outside the ordinary course of business to somebody. So if the administrator wants to go and sell the whole business to a third party and sell all the assets, including unpaid stock, stock to trade suppliers, um, uh, he would need to get the trade supplier's approval to do that or a court order to do that. So the takeaway here is that in the administration, if you're registered on the PPSR, the administrator, when he goes and sells your goods, he should account to you for that sale price. If you're not registered, you're not gonna get any money back there and the administrator will keep it. In a liquidation scenario, so after the administration period and a liquidator is appointed to realise all the assets or um, there's no administration and there's a court order, um, what they call a winding up of, of, of a winding up order for a liquidator to sell the assets. There's no moratorium on secured creditors um, getting their stock back in liquidation. The secured creditors with like trade suppliers with uh, security over their unpaid stock can go and get their goods back. And if the, uh, the liquidator refuses to do that, they'll have a, um, a simple application of court for the rights to get their goods back. The liquidator shouldn't sell um, stock, unpaid stock of trade suppliers who are properly registered on the PPSR without their agreement either. So that protection is crucial for you to be on the PPS register if you've got that term, that, that, that retention of title term in your agreement. Now, uh, when the administrator has sold stock, which is subject to a PPSR registration and you haven't been paid for it, he's got to account. Now, what the administrator often does is he'll say, look, it's, a, it's, it's um, not as straightforward as you think. There's actually um, two different creditors claiming um, an interest over that stock that you supplied um, and I'm not sure who I've got to pay out of this. That could slow him down. Um, there could be an identification issue where two different trade suppliers are both pointing at the same item and saying, we both supplied, they're both claiming that they supplied that and the administrator can't work out which one of them supplied that. Uh, that slows things down when you have those disputes and or those issues and causes the administrator to spend more time on it and less money to come back for creditors. So what is really important in that scenario is that those creditors that are um, having a competing claim over the same asset to talk to each other and try and sort it out or come to an arrangement independent of the administrator if you can. Because if he's facilitating the whole thing, it's, it's incurring all the costs. And um, so if you know of one of your um, competitors who's supplying similar goods, the administrator's told you they're also making a claim, get on the phone to them and see if you can cut a deal about it and tell the administrator, that's all right, you can hand the money, we've agreed to, to split it between ourselves. Otherwise the pool of money is going to just that's, dwindle. That's right, yep. that's right. And the administrator will, will, will incur more costs and um, and you end up in a, in a, in a legal... It's way. often a good situation for the administrator, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, there's, when an administrator sells the goods and before he accounts, he's got to make sure he's... Um, accounting to the right parties and there's some special rules he's got to follow. And the the way the legislation works 
it distinguishes some asset classes and how um, who gets paid first. And the first one to look at is what they call circulating assets, and that's assets that are coming in and out. And you know, I've used the three examples there: cash, the cash position, if there's money coming in and out all the time, um, inventory, you've got stock coming in, it's being sold, and money which is owed by debtors of the customer. Um, that's always changing. They're not fixed assets. Now, when an administrator sells um, or realises any of those types of assets, before he pays um, uh, banks back, for example, he's got to account to unpaid employees. Luckily for trade suppliers, there's an exception in there for trade suppliers who have retention of title over their stock and have registered on the PPSA. If they've done those things, then they jump above the employee's claims and they'll get their, their um, money back on the sale of the stock via the administrator. Again, need to have a proper retention of title clause, need to have the registration done properly, otherwise you're not gonna have that benefit. Sales of non-circulating assets, um, like these are, these are items that aren't gonna be moving on. You know, for example, the forklift there, that's, that's, that's a um, part of the warehouse. Uh, the, that sale of that asset, if there's a secured creditor, like a bank or the forklift, um, vendor who took security over its forklift until the purchase price was paid off, um, on the sale of that asset, it would go back to that secured creditor um, and, the, and the employees um, aren't relevant for that particular type of asset class. So cost of the insolvency practitioner, and this is um, important because, uh, and to know how this works, because there's long-standing court authority that every administrator in Australia knows about that says that where they incur costs in realising um, and preserving your assets for sale, those costs come out and the, the balance gets paid back to you. So if an administrator um, has to secure a warehouse and pay some rent to an unpaid um, landlord, he'll say, well, there's a share of that rent that I need to come out of the sale of that asset um, before I pay it over to you. Or I've had to incur cost with employees um, going around and taking making stock takes and those costs need to come out before I pay it back to you. And there is no doubt that he has an entitlement to, to his costs or her costs of preserving assets which are owned by somebody else before he passes them on. Those costs come out in a, before the net return back to a trade supplier. So it's in everybody's interest to um, make sure there's as little work for the insolvency practitioner as possible in dealing with those uh, assets. Uh, in the usual course, the when, when costs have been incurred by an insolvency practitioner and he's realised the good, he will say, or he or she, he or she will say to the trade supplier, listen, I sold your goods, I've got a return of $20,000, um, but I've incurred costs and I think your share of those costs is $5,000. Are you happy for me to take out that 5,000 and pay you 15 and get an agreement with you? If he can't get an agreement, then he will go to court and he'll seek a cost order as to his costs coming out. And unfortunately, if he goes down that path, those costs of the court case will end up coming out as well. So again, to limit those costs, try and make it as easy as possible for the administrator. So resolving any disputes between different trade suppliers over the same good yourselves and then telling him what the deal is. Uh, and uh, tr tr doing what you can, so and answering these questions properly and providing information quickly to reduce his costs. Just generally, insolvency practitioners and, and, and a lot of bugbear of creditors is that the, the costs in a general liquidation are high. Now, uh, the liquidator or administrator needs to have their costs approved by creditors. So if you want to get involved in that, join the committee of inspection, which is a which is a small group of creditors who agree to be on that and they can approve the liquidator's costs and, and um, examine those costs before they're approved as well. Some new rules came in last year where you can review the costs of 
uh, liquidators and administrators. So if creditors, within six months of any approval, they can uh, get the creditors meeting to um, vote and approve a review of the liquidator's fees, an independent liquidator will be asked to come in and have a look at what those costs were and whether he thinks they were reasonable or not. Um, that's that's an option open, but you've got to have a creditors meeting um, and 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 the creditors to vote for that. That is 50% um, in value and numbers. Vote in favour of that at a meeting of creditors. So if you're all upset about the costs, that's the opportunity to um, to have that reviewed. And I think that's an important point there, um, and the intonation that you put on that last sort of sentence. It's really important that you don't just bury your head in an administration, particularly if you're owed quite a bit. It is your opportunity then and there to get involved, review costs, make sure you're happy with the process. Um, simply sort of sitting back and waiting to see what happens is, is never a good option. Um, it's like not voting at the election and then complaining about the person who got in. You have your opportunity to be involved and we strongly recommend that you get involved. Um, as early as possible. Just from a, a company going into administration, when it happens, there's, there's, there's often, there's obviously alerts, and this isn't, it's a slight plug here for Creditor Watch, obviously, but um, if you have a PPSR registration, your details are um, accessible by the administrator and they should contact you, but regardless of whether you've got a registration or not, by monitoring your customers, um, you will receive an email alert when a company does go into administration or has a winding up notification. Um, and that's always a, uh, a good way to be a little bit more proactive about being involved, understanding what you are owed, possibly finding out if those goods are still sitting on the factory floor, et cetera. So always keep in mind the tools that are available there. There's been a couple of cases, um, and I'll just mention one of them, noting the time, there was a plantation shutters case um, in 2019 and the um, Liquidator there sold a lot of stock that was subject to um, unpaid, which was unpaid to trade suppliers, basically, and um, and also there were some customers who um, paid deposits, customers of the company that had gone into liquidation, Plantation Shutters, that had paid deposits on some of those items, and uh, there was a bit of a mess, and the liquidator had incurred costs in working through the messes to the various shutter suppliers to the company and the customers who paid deposits and how it all worked and went to the court after it incurred all these costs and said, um, uh, and basically to cut a long story short, the court granted a levy. So it said um, a levy of, and I think it was 66% for uh, costs for um, trade suppliers. So if trade suppliers wanted their goods back, they had to agree that 60, 66% of the net return of those goods um, could go to the um, liquidator and there was a lower um, uh, levy for customers to complete their um, or to come out of the completion of their purchases because of um, the court said because they um, weren't going to get a tax deduction unlike the trade suppliers. But So you can see how the court has a look at this after the event and I've also seen another um, matter um, where the uh, liquidator or went up to court within days of his appointment and got an order from the court in advance of him incurring costs that all of his costs could come out of the assets before he handed over to trade suppliers. And that was a very unfortunate order for the creditors in that matter that the court allowed and um, put them on the back foot basically for the rest of the um, administration. And so when you do have customers that go into insolvency, as Patrick said, get involved because you know, if, if, if the liquidator is going to be running up to court to get orders in advance of costs being incurred, that creditor may want to have a say about that and say, well, hang on, that's not really fair. We'd like to actually see what those costs are before um, that comes out of our stock that we're unpaid for. And is this where Turks would be involved at that stage? Oh, certainly, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's our um, specialty is in the area of recovery of PPSR assets on behalf of creditors where there's been an insolvency appointment of a um, to, to a customer to make sure you can get your assets back as quickly as possible and limit the liquidator's costs. And the, the administrators and liquidators, they're professionals. They know what they're doing. They do this day in, day out. So it's where you need to really consider the sizable amount that you're owed. You know, you might need to spend a little bit of money to save that money. That's right. Yeah. 
So um, tips for dealing with insolvency practitioners, um, try and when, when there's an, appoint, an appointment to one of your customers, an administration appointment or liquidation, speak to the administrator and get down to the site as quickly as possible so you can write down a list of what goods of yours are there and identify them. Uh, try and get the, um, if, if, if the administrator wants to realise those goods outside the ordinary course, get his agreement on what his costs are going to be on that, even if it's say 10%, um, just get that deal done early rather than later. Um, if there is conflicts with other of your competitors over the same who supplied a particular item of stock, reach an agreement with them on the side and tell the administrator about that. That would save a lot of administrators' costs in, in um, facilitating um, something between all the creditors. And, um, and as we just spoke about, get involved in court applications. Get on the committee of inspection. Um, then you can keep an eye on costs as well. Another benefit um, in just wrapping up to um, for creditors who um, register their interests on the PPSA to protect their retention of title clause um, so they can get back from insolvency administrators their unpaid stock is liquidated unfair preference claims. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, the legislation allows a liquidator of a company to look back at the records of a company and say, look, some creditors over the last six months before my appointment were paid some of their debt off and other creditors weren't paid as much or weren't paid at all. And I don't think that's fair. And so I am allowed to ask those creditors who were paid for their supply in that six month period to pay it back to the company. And then I will put it into the pool to split amongst everybody, including the liquidators costs. It's um, something that trade suppliers um, don't like receiving is letters asking them to pay back money they've received um, in good faith for the supply of their goods. If you are registered on the PPSA, you are regarded as a secured creditor. Going back to the start of this presentation today, you're treated just like a bank. Liquidators' unfair preference claims aren't allowed to be made upon secured creditors, only allowed to be made upon unsecured creditors. So um, you have a, by registering on the PPSA and having a good retention of title clause, you have the opportunity to um, avoid those unfair preference claims or defend those if they're brought against you. And like, Putting that into sort of practical terms, you could be an unsecured creditor where you may have been owed $100,000, you've managed to get 50,000 out of them, you know, pre-administration. You then don't get anything back post-administration because you're not, you haven't got a security over any of your goods. And then you get hit with an unfair preference claim from a liquidator on that $50,000. Yes. Right, and it could have, you could have potentially saved yourself all of this hassle with a simple sort of seven-year PPS registration, right? That's right. About, could have saved, about 10 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you could have saved the $50,000 unfair preference claim and you'd have an opportunity to get back any stock um, that, he, that the liquidator was holding yeah. of yours to, to improve the 50 grand to maybe 70 grand. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of brings us to the end of, of Daniel's presentation. Um, I, I'm not going to go over PPSR logic too much because we've, we've done plenty of, you know, sort of advertising and, and um, you know, promotion of it. I've just got a slide here that, that sort of talks about it a little bit. Um, if, if you do want more information, obviously contact Creditor Watch or jump on the website ppsrlogic.com.au. Anything related to PPSR, PBSR Logic can do for you, create, manage, renew. We can do that in bulk. We'll send you alerts when registrations are coming up for renewal so you don't miss that and end up at the bottom of the, the pile again if you miss the renewal date. Um, it integrates with Applyeasy, it integrates with Creditor Watch. More often than not, it's a single click registration, renewal, amendment, discharge, etc. cetera. Um, so please obviously have a look at that if it is relevant. What I did want to do, We've got um, hundreds of people that have attended uh, and we always like to make sure that those who are particularly interested in hearing more information um, get followed up first. So I've just got a quick poll here for you. Would you like to be contacted 
um, to find out more information about PPSR. Um, and I've got a couple of options here for you. Yes, from Turks Legal. Yes, from PPSR Logic Creditor Watch. Yes, from both of us or no. Don't be um, shy to put no. We totally understand that um, you know you may be across all of this and may not be relevant. So um, you know we want we obviously want honesty here, but it's always good for us to know exactly who is interested, so we can prioritise getting back to you about that. So I appreciate you um, voting there. Apologies if there's a few too many options to go through after um, after lunch or if you are eating lunch at the moment, get the brain going again. Give that another 10 seconds and then um, we will most likely wrap up. I might jump in and have a look at how many questions there are. Um, I am conscious of time um, with everyone. So uh, what I will do here is jump through and have a quick look and just see if there's any questions in here that Daniel wants to take on. Give us a second. So we've got a couple of things around, please contact us, which is great. Thank you for that. We will certainly get through to you. Um, Daniel, any that are sort of jumping out at you? Um, Sorry, it's just reading through it, everyone. Um, am I able to exercise retention of title before an appoint appointment is made? Well, yes, you are. You That's, that's something. Uh, if, if your customer is not paying you for the goods, um, but there's no insolvency appointment to the customer, you can um, uh, go and ask for your goods back. Um, the better your terms are there, the easier that will be. Um, if you've, um, you may have to go to court if they say no, like you, you, you just can't rock up. But if you've got some types of well drafted clauses, you may just be able to rock up and take them back. Um, but a simple one-liner like I was showing you before is not going to give you those rights up without a court application yeah. unless they do it by agreement. And usually engage a, most likely a lawyer at that stage, if particularly if it has to yes. go through a sort of court action and then post-court action. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That, that, that's right. Any others? Um, what, what we might do, we've, we've got quite a number here that are, are, are fairly technical. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than trying to answer it um, over a webinar, we might, I will get these questions yep. out to out yep. to Daniel yep. and Daniel can and give you a bit of a free legal advice. There okay. you go. Yeah, Just no problem. There's a couple of questions about, <laughs> a couple of questions there about hiring goods. And, and of course, if, if you lease goods um, for um, over um, a two year period, I think it is at the moment, um, then it's registrable as well by, by the, um, by the lessor. Um, if 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 they don't register um, and they and it's a, it's a sort of a, a, a long term lease like that, then uh, and the company goes who's, who's leasing them goes into an insolvency administration or an individual goes bankrupt, then you will lose those goods. All right, fantastic. I'll um, wrap that up now, and we will get back to those questions. There were plenty in there. I'm conscious of time and the and the complexity that that goes with answering some of those more technical questions. Um, so I just wanted to say, Daniel, thanks again for joining us today. It was great. Plenty of questions coming out of it. I dare say there's probably the opportunity for a follow-up um, webinar, no doubt. Um, so you and I can talk about that. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. I hope you got something out of it. Um, as I said, we will get more information out to those that did ask questions and we will have the slides and the video recording of today's presentation out within the next sort of 24 hours. If there is something specific around PPSR, um, you know, insolvency um, practitioners, claims, unfair preferences, I think I just wrote down unfair preference claims is, is probably certainly a webinar topic that we could do, that we could do in the future. Um, we're always open and willing to listen and um, yeah, we want you guys to drive those subjects for us. So Daniel, thanks again for joining us and thank you to everyone. And, yep, thanks for having me, Pat, and thank you everybody for listening. See you later everyone, have a great, great week.